All right, we're winding our way down through the Gospels, and uh, we're going to look again at Jesus' miracle ministry today. New Testament Greek word for miracles is samaios, which has a little bit of a sound like the equi English equivalent, uh, signs. And as with all signs, miracles are never about themselves. They're about whatever they're pointing toward. And in Jesus' case, they're pointing directly to God. Miracles clue us in on the fact that there's a city out there beyond the realm of our imagination whose architect and builder is God himself. It's a fixed reality. It's more definite than anything we can perceive with our, our physical senses. It's beyond, Paul says, what man can imagine. And more and more people have been resuscitated in, in you know, recent years, and they've come back with stories of what, that's, of what it's like. Peggy Noonan once wrote that she thought miracles existed in part as gifts and in part as clues. There's something beyond the flat world we see. If miracles exist at all, they exist not for their own sake, but for us, to point us towards something beyond, to someone beyond. Now, that quote is from a book called Miracles by Eric Metaxas. It's full of miracle stories of people that he knows personally and trusts. Uh, you know, these verifiable accounts. They, the book has really encouraged me. I, I think it will encourage you too. Uh, we had a few copies. I bet they're gone. But the, if you sign up, the bookstore, they'll order more. So uh, it, it is definitely worth reading. Eric makes the point of saying, that because God created each of us differently, he communicates with us individually. Though he is the same God for every one of us in his tenderness and desire to reach us, he's able to speak to us in ways that are very specific to us. And you'll, you're going to see what he means uh, in a video that we're going to watch here in a few seconds. This is about a dream he had. And we can't use the whole thing too long. Let me just set it up with a couple of things. This will make it make more sense. His dad came from Greece, so Eric grew up in the Greek Orthodox Church. Uh, his grades were exceptional, got him into Yale. He's an intellect, you know, and by the time he graduated, he didn't know who he was or what he believed. I mean, he was a mess. By 24, he was living in his parents' basement, working a job he hated for Union Carbide. And, uh, and that's where he met Ed Tuttle, a, a, a genuine Christian who befriended him. You'll need to remember this. Er, uh, Ed told him that he needed to ask God to reveal himself. Ed had been praying for him, and Eric was in so much pain that finally he turned that into prayer, asking God to give him a sign. Now, this is, this is what he asked. God, give me a sign to let me know you're real. And what you're about to watch is what God did. Now, Eric loved fishing as a kid, so that plays into this. Let's watch. You know, I just think it's so important what we're talking about today. I want to just stop for a second. I just want to ask God to do something. Lord, uh, I'm so aware that we don't have the ability to see beyond what you illumine. And so today, I am asking you to just saturate the atmosphere in this room and open our blind eyes and our deaf ears and give us an ability by your Spirit to hear your voice, to see things we've never seen. Holy Spirit, come. Right now, I'm asking for it. I'm asking for your presence and activity to be very, very much experienced and felt here. And I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. To be born again is to go from darkness to light. The human heart changes. It's a supernatural, radical transformation that is absolutely miraculous. Jesus, uh, when he's here, he's, he's opening blind eyes and deaf ears. He restored muscle to shrivel limbs and breath to dead bodies. He spoke to storms and they stopped. He spoke to food and it multiplied. Demons freaked out and fled in his presence and people flocked to wherever he was to see it for themselves and get their own miracle. But the why of his miracles was to get people to the what? To his message. The gospel was Jesus' number one priority. It's the core statement he makes here in John 3, 16. Let's read this together right off the screen. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and whoever believes in him shall not perish, 
but have everlasting life. The gospel is the good news about Jesus becoming one of us, about him tackling our deepest need. We, need, we were dead in our sins, but he is the resurrection and the everlasting life. Signs point us to the giver of life. These miracles point us to Jesus. Historians say in the early church, uh, from 100 to 400 AD, that's a considerable amount of time, the biggest factors leading to the massive spread of Christianity were all the healings and exorcisms taking place. And I believe that will once again characterize the church before Jesus returns. The Bible says that God is going to pour out His Spirit in that one generation in an unprecedented way. And I believe we have that yet to come. So with Jesus' supernatural ministry as our focus, we're going to plug back into where we left him two weeks ago. Uh, he's in the region of Samaria. He traveled and taught for some months in the south and in and around Jerusalem. You're seeing it there on the maps. And, and now he heads north. Uh, and John 4, 45 says, when he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover festival. Man, these people travel. Have you noticed that? I mean, they all went down to Jerusalem. For they had, they had also been there. Once more, he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain uh, royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, uh, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son who was close to death. Now, I'm sure you can imagine the desperation this dad is feeling. I mean, there is nothing more desperate than when your child is sick. Jesus, I'm about to lose my boy. You know, he's, he's, he's going to die if you don't come and heal him. But we got to hurry, please. He's, he's like 15 miles away, and this is all going to be done on foot. And Jesus says something very curious. He says, unless you people see signs and wonders, you'll never believe. Wait, what's, what's that got? What's believing got to do with it? I'm begging you, sir. Come with me before my child dies. Verse 50, Jesus replied, go. Your son will live. He's saying, here's the test. I want you to believe. I want you to know that I'm a, my authority is greater than time and distance. Just believe in who I am. I'm your child's creator. I'm, I'm the master of physics. I don't need to go. And the man took Jesus at his word. He believed and departed. While he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that the boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son had got better, they said to him, yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. Now, this may seem subtle, but yesterday means the conversation with Jesus happened the day before, which means he didn't just talk to Jesus and rush home to be with his son, because, you know, he could have gotten back probably by dark. Instead, he spends the night there. Maybe he thought... Thank you. You know, my son's going to be okay. You know, since I'm already here, I may as well, you know, take care of some business before I leave town. Because it, it, it's apparent here that anxiety is just, you know, drained right out of this guy. He's thinking, my son's healed. Finally, life can return to normal. He trusted what Jesus said. He hadn't seen it with his eyes yet, but he was at peace because he believed Jesus' word. And that's exactly the response the Lord is looking for in us. He wants us to respond to him with faith. He tells us, if I've said it, you just believe it. I'll speak to that storm in your, in your soul and speak peace to it. But you just go about your business. I got this. So often his word is all we've got. Every, everything looks and feels the same. and All we can do is rest in what he said. I, I, when I was a kid, I grew up seeing that uh, I guess it was a hymn, you know, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. You know, that's a, that's a real easy song to sing. That's a real hard thing to do, right? I so want to help God out with all my worrying, you know, because I think worry helps things. <laughs> when, I was, when I was, oh, I was, used to struggle with flying, and I would, I would literally... I would hold myself up on the armrest, thinking that maybe I was lightening the load of the plane. Now, I, I, that's the insanity of worry. Jesus said it this way, Matthew 6, 27, can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? No, but it sure feels like it, you know? <laughs> I was driving to church the other day, 
And I'm getting all anxious about the day, you know, ramped up, all had to be done. And the Holy Spirit just, you know, pulled up a verse that I had been meditating on in prayer that morning. And it's where the Apostle Paul makes this statement in Philippians 3.3. He says, for we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. And yeah, there were a bunch of Jews that were trying to get Christians to be Jewish and and so that's what he's addressing there. But he said, we rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort, or as many translations say, the flesh. And I sense God just, you know, calming me, saying, Ron, this is where all your anxiety comes from. You're putting confidence in your human ability to affect outcomes. You, you get ramped up thinking that you have to do this. You know, Lean back. You know, Jesus said in John 15, 5, without me, speaking of the Holy Spirit, you can do nothing. And I am convinced the great struggle of the Christian life is to really believe that and walk it out. I think that's it right there. I, I, I want to get better at this. You know, I've been asking God, God, let me see the spiritual poverty and depravity and brokenness in my heart to the point that I put no confidence in it. That I, that I put no trust in my ability to fix myself or accomplish anything. Because I know when I do that, I've got history. When I do that, when I lean on the Holy Spirit's power, all kinds of wonderful things happen. You know, I end up, I end the day marveling, like the Apostle Paul, at how God works through my weakness. God actually told him, he said, in your weakness, my strength is perfected. When you're weak, I'm strong in you. So I'm, I'm, I'm on a quest to get this. I'm thinking, God, I'm, you know, I'm in my 60s here. I need to get this down. Come on, help me. <laughs> All right, let's jump over to Luke chapter 4 where Jesus lays out his mission, which is, this is the assignment. This is what God sent him to earth to accomplish. All right, here, verse 14, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and over the next 18 months, he'll be traveling around visiting the 204 towns and villages, praying for the sick, preaching the gospel to the two to three million people that are in that vicinity. And without any cell phones, email, or internet, Luke says news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where, they, where, where he had been brought up. So Jesus of Nazareth comes home to Nazareth. You know, this is the hometown boy here. There are maybe 400 people who lived in this little village. And if you come from a small town, you know, everybody knows everybody and everything about everybody. <laughs> and they all know Joseph's son, you know, who is the quiet carpenter kid that makes good furniture. But suddenly, this hometown boy is a rock star. Fame has come to Nazareth. Well, he goes to the synagogue, and I can imagine him you know, squeezing in because it's standing room only, necks are craning, everybody's trying to get a look at him. Because you got to remember, Jesus has always been God, but he hasn't publicly revealed his identity. He's, he's remained hidden. The hiddenness of Jesus is what blows me away. So for 30 years, all they knew was the kid and now this ordinary looking young man who grew up among them. But this time he is back in the power of the Spirit. So they want a demonstration. <laughs> they want to see what they've been hearing about. Verse 16, on the Sabbath, he went to the synagogue, as was his custom. Now, synagogues were where the Jews met for their Sabbath services. They'd, you know, sing hymns and psalms and pray and read scriptures, and someone would teach on a passage or two, and during the week, they would gather for prayer and Bible study. It became really the model for uh, uh, the church. These were perfect places for Jesus and his disciples to teach. So they would tend to go from village to village. Every village uh, had one, and they'd teach in the synagogue. The lar larger towns had several. They got started when the Babylonians invaded Israel back in uh, 586 B.C. They demolished Jerusalem, destroying the temple, and marching the people 700 miles to Babylon, where they remained in captivity for 70 years. And far from home, they would come together in homes so that men like Ezekiel could explain the scriptures to them. When they get back to the land, they continue the practice in these kind of meeting halls that they call synagogues. By the first century, they were everywhere, in Galilee, Judea, all over the Mediterranean world. So Jesus is in the synagogue that he had spent so much time in growing up. It was like, you know, coming back to your home church. 
when I was back in uh, Booty, Louisiana a few years ago, my parents helped build the church there, a little Assembly of God church there. And uh, when Debbie and I attended, they, you know, were all, got all excited, wanted me to say a few words. So I, I'm just, you know, kind of, when I read this, I'm imagining what Jesus must have felt. They still call me Ronnie down there, by the way. So, you know, they don't, they don't know this Ron business. And uh, so one of the guys I grew up with just had to get up in the service after I spoke to say that he still can't believe I made anything of my life, much less in ministry. <laughs> Which, truth be told, I had to agree. I was a very shy, backwards kid. Well, verse 16 says, he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. The leader of the synagogue would sometimes ask people from the community to read, maybe make a comment or two. Visiting rabbis were invited to preach. So every eye is on him as he unrolls the scroll to find Isaiah 61. Now, remember, back then, the, you didn't take the Bible home. The Bible stayed in the synagogue. And so, you know, uh, this is Jesus' story. And I'm sure he had read this like a thousand times right there in this very room. But he reads it now publicly with authority. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. So this is his mission statement. If Jesus had a job description, that's it right there. God the Father sent his Son to the poor broken captives, to the blind and the oppressed, because these people need a savior, and his main point is they know it. They know they need his help. So we're gonna break that down. Let's, mission one, Jesus came to preach the gospel to the poor. And we know from his Sermon on the Mount, he's not talking about money. This is about being poor in spirit, because without God, we are all spiritually bankrupt. We are destitute. Isaiah 64, 6 says, the very best we've got is like filthy rags. All our efforts combined are nowhere close to good enough, even when they're better than everybody else's. Imagine you're the picture of health and prosperity. You know, you're feeling good, you're looking good, you know, your friends and coworkers envy your perfect life, you've got a great wife and kids and an awesome job, expensive house and cars, and you take fantastic vacations. You even got a six pack. <laughs> yeah, there's a little twinge of pain in your gut now and then, but it, it's nothing. And I, you know, not like you need to see a doctor for it. But if you only knew that that twinge was actually stage four cancer and your perfect life was nothing but an illusion, I mean, you'd be at the emergency room right now. When these religious guys criticized Jesus for hanging out with outcasts and sinners in Luke 5.31, he told them, look, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I haven't come to call those who think they are healthy, but those who know they are sinners and need to be, repent. God sent Jesus to be the cure for our sin cancer because we've all got it. The good news is that for those who will face their condition, that's the point, and ask for his help, there's now a cure. There's now a cure. There's a balm in Gilead, uh, uh, one scripture says. There's a healing ointment. His name is Jesus. Mission two, Jesus says he came to heal the brokenhearted. If you look up broken in the dictionary, it means reduced to fragments, ruptured, torn, fractured, out of order. Most of us know what it feels like to have our heart shattered. Usually happens in high school. <laughs> you know, when the hurt just goes down to the deepest part of who you are, you know, you just feel like it's been shredded. Maybe some of you are feeling that right now. Maybe some event in your life has left you just feeling crippled emotionally and physically exhausted. David knew that kind of pain and some. 34, 18, he writes, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. David experienced that. As a man, Jesus endured every human struggle. He knows the pain of a broken heart. He, that's why he came to heal us. 
It's why he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, those who recognize this in themselves and come to me. Those are the ones who get help. He's revealing himself as our great physician who heals broken hearts and broken lives. Mission three, he came to free captives. He's talking about spiritual prisoners who are chained by sin and guilt. It's the stuff we can see like addiction and greed and the stuff we can't like bitterness, jealousy, hatred, pride. All those things that love the dark. There are hundreds of prophecies about the, uh, the Messiah in the Old Testament. I want to read you one in, in the New. This is John the Baptist's father, Zechariah the priest. In Luke 1, 70, 70, he says, when Messiah comes, he will give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Oh, I love this. Because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven. He's talking about Jesus. To shine on those who live, uh, those living in the dungeon of darkness in the shadow of death, to guide their feet into the path of peace. Until Jesus showed up, think, of, think about this, until Jesus showed up, showed up, sin could only be pardoned or covered by the blood of sacrificial animals. Jesus' blood, because it's human and sinless, can actually remove our sin. Jesus' death on the cross, and, and we get this in, in the New Testament, was the perfect sacrifice. It was, it was what all the Old Testament sacrifices were pointing to. Jesus' sacrifice was once for all time and for all people. In his sinless body, oh, this is so powerful, God was judging our sin. So as Paul puts it, God can now be right in making us right. Hebrews 10, 14 says, for by that one offering, he, Jesus, forever made perfect those who are being made holy. That's us. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all our sin as we learn to walk in his righteousness. That's what he's saying. It totally removes the stain of our sin. Luke 4, 18 says, he came to bring release to the captives. And it's interesting that the, the, the literal Greek word release, that face is there, means forgiveness. And that's the way a spiritual prisoner is free, to have his sins forgiven. Messiah will release the captives by forgiving their sins, which opens prison doors. It opens the prison of guilt and self-recrimination and all the horrible stuff that sin does to us. Number four, he came to restore sight to the blind. Again, this is a reference to spiritual darkness being unable to see and understand the truth. This is such a revealing statement. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. For God, who said, let there be light in the darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts so we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. You know, I have people sometimes say to me, uh, you know, I've been talking to my friend about the Lord, and it's like they're just blind. It's like they just can't see it. They just, you know, I explain it to them, and it's like they're deaf. They just can't hear it. And I said, well, yeah, that Bible says that. So what do I do? You pray that God removes the blindness, that God takes away the deafness, that God opens their ears and opens their heart to receive the truth. Jesus restores our capacity to see and know God. The Bible doesn't make sense until you're born again. That's what he told Nicodemus. We remember reading that story. It's not going to make sense to you until you're born again, until something happens inside. Jesus is the only one who can open blind eyes to spiritual reality and truth. David understood that back in the Old Testament. He said, it's only in your light that we see light. All right, one more. He came to set at liberty the oppressed. This is the person who's overwhelmed by a lie. Maybe by an abusive relationship or a chronic illness and they're just, or they're buried under a mountain of debt or smothered by paralyzing depression to the point where life's just impossibly hard. Messiah comes to the weary and burdened and gives them rest. He's gentle and humble and hard and in him they find rest. Now Jesus is standing here in his hometown synagogue reading from Isaiah about this deliverer that God has sent 
to the poor, the blind, the oppressed prisoners, to make them spiritually rich, to bring the kind of forgiveness that sets them free from a prison of death and hell, to give them sight and rest for their tired, stressed out minds. (laughs) And and then he says it, oh boy. (laughs) I'm just thinking, you know, we all think, I'd love to have been a disciple, whoa. If you think about what they were, the changes he put them through, he says, so Jesus is teaching all this. He says, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Isaiah's talking about me. I'm your Messiah. I'm, the day of salvation has come. Ta-da. Now, that is an outrageous thing for Joseph's son to be saying, you know. But, you know, he had worked all those miracles in Jerusalem that they had, you know, seen and some of them had seen and others had heard about. And at this point, they're willing, okay, well, let this slide. You know, they're, th- they're just anxious to see what he can do. They're thinking, you know, you're home now. Let's see what you got. Come on. Give us your best. We'll look at the prophecy stuff later, you know. In verse 23, Jesus said, surely you'll quote me this proverb, or you'll quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, do here in your hometown what we've heard that you did in Capernaum. He said, I know what you guys want, but it's not going to happen. I'm not here to perform for you. My father calls the shots. I do whatever he says. And then he he talks history with him. He says about, he tells them about the time. Now, they're all familiar with these stories. I mean, they've heard these again and again. About the time of severe drought that came to Israel And yet when God sent help through the prophet Elijah, he walked right past Israel's many widows to provide supernaturally for a widow in a foreign land? Now, I'm sure you can imagine, this is not playing well. (laughs) The disciples are, you know, they're going, oh, no. You know, what is he doing? What is he saying? Because the people are getting mad at this point. And they can see it, and Jesus knows it, But that doesn't stop him. Verse 27, he says, there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elijah the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. Now they're furious. In fact, they're getting the fact that he's talking about them and basically saying, you're not going to see a single thing. So verse 29 says, they got up and drove him out of town and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. I mean, they are so enraged, they're going to kill him. Verse 30 says, but he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Wasn't time for him to die. See, Jesus had this unbelievable ability to lock into God to where he said, no man takes my life. You know, I lay it down. But we're going to see this kind of hatred. We're going to see this kind of violent rejection follow Jesus right up till they finally nail him to a cross there in Jerusalem. People today still want Jesus' power and blessing. They'll take the miracles. What they don't want is his message. Jesus said, here's why people don't come to me. Here it is. They prefer darkness over light because their deeds are evil. They don't want to come to me because they don't want their sin exposed. They're, they're not ready to let it go. They don't want, to, they, they don't want it to be called sin. They don't, they don't want to face what they're doing or what it's doing to them. And until they get miserable enough, or the life that they've tried to make crashes in on them, that's pretty much where a lot of people stay. It's where they live. I want you to hear the story of a famous hip-hop artist who found Jesus in the crash. Let's watch. I know there are some of you sitting here this morning and you're in a dark place right now. You've made some really bad choices looking for a place to fit in and be significant and like you're worth something. But now, something's happening in your heart. You're ready to say, God, get me out of this. Get me out of this. It can happen for you right here. You don't have to have a car wreck. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. You know, this might be your very last opportunity to pull out of the death spiral you're in. This might be it. Today, Jesus wants to bring you into the the light and illumine you. But only you can let him. 
Only you can understand. And until you do, you will remain in that prison, living under the wrath of a holy God that you'll one day stand before as king and judge. Hell is way too hot, and eternity is way too long for you to gamble with your eternal soul. Don't do it. Don't do it. Stop it right here. Right now. You can let Jesus be your substitute and take away all your sins. Right here. You can be born again. You can become a member of God's family. It starts with surrender. You come clean. You acknowledge that you're not just a person who sins occasionally. You're a sinner at the core of your being, and you're in need of saving. That's where it starts. Jesus came to save sinners. He didn't come to call people who think they're already good enough. I mean, if you don't know that you've got the cancer, then you're not going to come to Jesus for the cure. You need to admit your brokenness. You need to admit where you're at. So I want to just pray for you right now. I want you to bow your heads with me. Father, I thank you for your presence here this morning. I thank you that you're in this room right now speaking to us. You loved us so much that you watched your only son die on a cross. Jesus, you came and you laid down your life. Pray that everyone sitting here who doesn't yet know you, right now, that the Holy Spirit would be active and at work. Let them see their brokenness. Let them see the spiritual depravity that's at work within them so they'll come to you for healing and forgiveness. Holy Spirit, would you convict them of their sin? Convince them to believe in the only one who can save them. Help them receive the love that you offer them. And I ask that in Jesus' powerful name. Now with your head's bowed and your eyes closed because I don't, I don't want people looking around and I really don't want anybody leaving right now. This is too important. This is eternity is at stake right here. How many of you sitting here would say, yes, I want Jesus. I want my sins forgiven. I want to go to heaven. I, I want to be born again. I want this relationship you're talking about. If you want your sins forgiven, if you want Jesus Christ to come into your life, if you want to know that you will go to heaven when you die, wherever you are, I want you to lift your hand and I want you to keep it up for a few minutes because I'm going to pray for you. All over the building, hands are going up, all over, all over. If you have any insecurity about your salvation, now's the time to just say, that's me, pray for me, pray for me, all over, see hands all over. All right, now I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. Jesus said, if you'll confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. This has got to be more than you just saying, you know, just pray for me because I'm going to lead you in a prayer. But to do it, I want you to do what I think Jesus would say to you. I want you to stand right where you are. We're going we're gonna to pray right here together, all right? All over the auditorium, hands are raised. Stand with me right now. No one's looking around. Just stand with me, all over the audience, all over the audience, because God is going to do a work in hearts right here. All over the audience, people are standing. Now, I know there's a bunch of others of you that need to be standing right now. This is it. You're going to look back on this day. This is going to be the day where your eternal life shifted this is it. This is the moment. And God has been at work in this place this weekend. We had some people coming to the Lord in, in, in both of these services where God's presence was there. Now, I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and I'm going to just have you repeat this with me, all right? Just, I just want you to say this. Now, I, here's the thing. I want you to say this like you're a drowning person, like you are reaching out to Jesus for his help. We're going to say this with you, all right? Everybody just want you to repeat these words with me. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, but I know you're a Savior. You died on the cross, you rose from the dead, and you did it for me. Jesus, would you come into my life? Would you be my Savior? Would you be my Lord, my God, my friend? Fill me now with your Holy Spirit. I surrender my will to yours. I come under your leadership. I choose to follow you now with all of my heart, with all of my soul, with all of my mind and strength. I want to really know you, Lord. And I pray that in Jesus' powerful name. All right, let me pray for you. God, right now, 
Would you just cement this? Come, Holy Spirit, and do what you love to do. Reignite the Spirit in every person that's standing here. Let them encounter your love. Make it real, Lord. Make it real in the name of Jesus. Let them encounter you right here, right now. Let this be a watershed event, a life-changing event. This moment, in Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to the family. Welcome to God's family.